Hello and welcome to our uh, Laser Santa Fe uh, uh, coming to you virtually. Um, I'm really excited uh, that we can be doing this. Um, I'm Andrea Poli. Um, I'm the uh, director of SciArts Santa Fe, a uh, new nonprofit uh, in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We have been hosting lasers. Uh, these are Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous uh, that happen all uh, over the world um, uh, in uh, collaboration with the Leonardo uh, Journal of um, Art Science and Technology. So you can actually link up to not just the laser Santa Fe's, but lasers um, in 30 cities around the world uh, now. Um, here's a little map of some of the cities. So we've been offering uh, Laser Santa Fe um, for, uh, this will be our third year. Uh, we were hoping to start in March, but unfortunately uh, the world intervened and uh, we are now picking up uh, with uh, this, uh, um, with this August laser uh, in conjunction with the Currents Festival and thanks to uh, Vital Spaces. Um, before we, uh, I pass uh, this on to Alicia Guzman who will be introducing our distinguished speakers, I just wanna thank uh, our team. Uh, uh, Susan Latham, uh, who's been so instrumental in keeping Laser Santa Fe together and even more so importantly uh, with uh, the COVID situation. Um, our two AmeriCorps uh, VISTAs organizers, uh, Amy Pilling, who has started her third year with us and has uh, been uh, really instrumental in, in coming up with the design and the organization of this uh, laser, and uh, Alicia Guzman, our newest um, AmeriCorps VISTA, who is um, going to be serving as moderator today. So I'm just um, so pleased, and I also want to thank uh, our core um, uh, Sire at Santa, Santa Fe uh, member group, uh, <clears throat> including uh, Tom Greenbaum and um, uh, P, uh, Paul Biaggi, who you'll see uh, hopefully in a laser uh, coming up uh, here soon, uh, Richard Lowenberg, uh, and uh, a whole host of uh, uh, Morgan Barnard, uh, a number of, of different people um, who are, are serving as our core group. And uh, we look forward to, of course, this laser and uh, more lasers to come. So thank you so much for being here. Hi, everybody. My name is Alicia Inez Guzman, and I will be today's laser uh, moderator. I'm joined by artist Adrian Siegel and uh, computer scientist Stephen Guerin. The topic of today's laser is really exciting and very prescient. It's called From, Vis From Visualization to Physicalization, Wildfire, Wildfire Data in Art and Science. And we're really looking at how an artist and a computer scientist use similar data sets. And so with that said, we'll kick it off with Stephen and Adrian. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Daphne. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Nice to be here. <laughs> um, so I wonder if, you know, either of you can just begin a little bit by introducing your practices and how you're looking at data from what seem to be kind of polar opposites. And then we'll meet in the middle. Adrian? Um, sure. Yeah, I... Um... I am primarily an artist out of Oakland, California, and I first started working with um, data as kind of a conceptual resource in my work, um, mostly sculpture, when I was still in school, um, getting my undergraduate degree in furniture design. Um, and I started looking at tide patterns initially so like ocean tide cycles and that kind of worked its way into a physical visualization essentially of um, understanding how those cycles undulate over time and representing them as um, 
a physical sculpture that you could walk around and really see all of those dynamic um, temporal cycles in one experience as a person. And um, I kind of just kept going from there because data allows me to incorporate all of the ideas about anything in the world that I find really interesting or fascinating or want to learn more about. Um, and I get to research them and, and bring them into a project as a way to express those ideas to other people in an unexpected format. Yeah, and I'm, uh, I'm kind of think relatedly, I'm very interested in bringing data uh, out into a physical uh, presence. So uh, I was attracted to Santa Fe initially because of the research going on at Santa Fe Institute and Los Alamos Labs, kind of in the disciplines of complex systems or looking out systems uh, self-organize. And, you know, for 20 years, I've been modeling these types of systems, uh, whether it's how ants find food, how birds flock, traffic, crowds. Uh, as we get into physical systems like fire and clouds, um, the, the methods in computer science are very similar in forms of what we call agent-based modeling of how we uh, model these systems. And I'd always been on the visualization side, um, but around 2008, saw firefighters working in sand tables, physical sand tables, where they would be uh, doing after action review or planning for the next fire. And I really was engaged by the physical and tangible nature of that. And I saw them around a table and they even called it a simulation, even though there was no, there were no computers around. And I'm very, um, so I, so it was very interesting and we explored a, uh, augmenting their experience instead of replacing it, you know, with VR or AR, where it's, um, you know, screen mediated or removed from reality. So we really just wanted to bring the light into their, into their room and, and, and augment the physical processes already happening um, instead of replacing it. Thank you. So I think that this is probably a good time to discuss what the term physicalization actually means, because I know we're we're edging toward it based on your introductions, but if we could talk a little bit more about physicalization, I think that would be really helpful. Yeah, that's a great point. It's sort of a new word that I think is somewhat being fully accepted um, in the, the field of information design or what's also known as data visualization. It's kind of a subsect of data viz. And um, the idea is that instead of using a data set to drive a two-dimensional chart or graph or map, um, you're, you're applying that data and embedding it in a three-dimensional form. So um, a physical object is uh, being mapped with information so that you can understand it in a tangible way. Um, I guess that's my best attempt at, at uh, describing that. Um, what about you, Stephen? You want to add to that? Well, Adrian introduced me to the term too, so I didn't. You know, so there's a community out there that it's. Uh, I'm glad she she pointed it toward me. You know, I was aware of sonification and obviously visualization. Um, you know, I I, th I see it as kind of the dual of you know 30 years of digitization, bringing the physical world into the computer, right and this is just kind of reversing the process of bringing digital information into the physical world. Um, in computer science, we also have physical computing, right? Where with sensors and actuators out in the real world. Uh, so I think uh, the physicalization is this representation and needn't be, um, you know, I think um, in taking a hint from visualization, there's, uh, if you're in scientific visualization, the axes are known, like a real space, X, Y, Z, when you represent something. But information visualization, the axes are up to the artist, right? And that's where it's a little bit more creative to define the space. And on our, probably physicalization has that same, you're mapping, it's open-ended to the artist of how to map from one space to another. And I, and I, I, and I really see that in Adrian's work. Yeah, and I'd just like to add that, um, if you take one further step back and you think about the natural world and how we've been able to derive a lot of these long-term trends and cycles and processes in the landscape, 
they actually come from physically embedded like data sets as it were in the landscape so like ice cores or the way that sediment you know um occurs over time and then you can derive information from different layers in the sediment or even you know dendrochronology the study of tree rings all of those um are literally physical like features of the landscape that we can then get information from so it, it is a yeah. lot about this back and forth between um the source of information and turning it quantifying it into numbers and then either taking those numbers into a digital realm and then using digital technology to draw them as information graphics um, or back into the analog world of physical. So there's a lot of translation involved um, in, in the process of, I would say, data visualization as well as physicalization. Yeah, I like the tree ring. It's kind of a biological time series, right? And mm -hmm. Visualization. And the, the data set that you're specifically looking at from these different um, disciplines is wildfire data. And I think that uh, that's occurring in the natural world and there's a translation process. So my question is how that translation process happens on either side of those disciplines into this potentially common ground of physicalization. So. Stephen, why don't you go first? Don't you? Okay. Yeah, so we got kind of pulled into the wildfire world, you know, in 2006 when we started, you know, working for the local Santa Fe Fire Department and County and Forest Service on simulating evacuations. And so that was kind of coupling social and physical, you know, the fire itself. Uh, but around 2009, when we started um, shipping the first sand table, um, then it was, you know, simulating forward here, what if a fire starts here, how is it going to spread on the, based on slope, fuel or vegetation type densities, temperature and uh, relative humidity. Uh, but around 2015, uh, when we had some deaths in Yarnell in 2013, uh, with some firefighters, but also uh, some citizens in the Gatlinburg fire and the tubs and, uh, you know, most recently the campfire, uh, 85 people died. Um, we really started focusing on how do we capture the reality? How do we use the distributed phones and cameras out there to get what are ultimately these perimeters? Uh, I think Adrian and I are both interested in these fire perimeters, which are time stamped uh, contours of where the fire was at a certain point in time. And you know that can that you can think of that as a vector, or you know it could be a raster of intensity. You know that could be another way of representing it, or or point cloud uh, data. But I think we both started off with just the contours, time stamped, and then we do a linear interpolation between them in uh, to project onto the sand table the rates of spread, and then that's where, how we can also then it's tuning our models to match what we observe. So it's, it's these, basically these timestamps that traditionally come from once a day or every other day from two airplanes that fly over the West in the US uh, capturing infrared. And then someone is then manually tracing the, uh, you know, there's three kinds of things they look at, the intense heat areas, the isolated heat, and then they draw a greater perimeter, kind of a, uh, an enclosing perimeter. And that's what we both start with when we, um, kind of interpolate that and visualize it in, in our two different ways. Um, yeah, to yeah, we're you definitely using the same data sets. Um, and my, my approach is um, almost somewhat way less scientific in that I'm not looking necessarily at heat intensity or more of the specific aspects of how a fire burns. I'm um, basically translating those perimeters into a three-dimensional form so that the third dimension from from the bottom up is time so that it captures change over time as a tangible static object whereas yours are actually um, live they are an animation in a sense so they change as you look at them mine are just uh, static forms and and um what what my initial interest is, I was doing a residency in San Diego and I started looking into wildfires. There was a very large wildfire there in 2003 called the Cedar Fire, um, which was the first sculpture I made of a fire. And 
that I believe is at the time that I was researching, it was the largest fire in California history. And I believe it still is the third largest. Um, but I was just really fascinated with how we think and talk about wildfire in this country um, and our approach to suppression um, that doesn't truly acknowledge the natural process that is, you know, a part of a healthy forest ecology. And there are, are a lot of um, ways in which fires are talked about in society uh, that refer to them as destructive and deadly and terrible disasters. And the they, monster. <laughs> yes, yes, they are that for humans, but they're also really necessary in other ways. There are seeds that can only um, produce new trees if they burn at some point. So um, the human perspective doesn't always acknowledge that there is a natural system that has been around much longer than us that was naturally burning um, regularly. And that's what kind of kept firefighters smaller. Um, and from my research, uh, there was a very, very large fire in 1910 in the Chicago kind of, it covered, I think, three states. It was around Montana and Illinois. It was a huge, huge fire. And that was when, um, policies about fighting fires really were established. And that's when they started putting out every single fire that started. And that's kind of what has led to where we are now, where fires get so much bigger and burn so much worse because there's all this underbrush because they haven't been naturally burning in smaller areas. And so I think that by turning some of that information, that data, those perimeters into a sculpture, you can start a dialogue about how how many um, different perspectives and how complex these issues are in society. We can start to talk about like, it, what is the right approach? And should we acknowledge that building houses in places that are primarily forest is not the smartest thing if you don't want your house to be burned down by a wildfire? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so just, um, I see art as a really, um, wonderful potential to engage people in thinking differently about the world around them. And, and I think that's where my interest in using scientific data such as for wildfires really drives my work forward. Yeah, I'd really like to follow up on that because that's, you know, the last, uh, I don't know, four years and it's my own learning about fire because I wasn't, you know, prior to 2007, you know, I actually kind of got sucked into this community, right? And but you know, four or five years ago, as we were studying in Santa Fe, origin of life and artificial life, how to model living systems. Um, in the 90s, it was all about evolutionary computation and you evolve it and it's very DNA and uh, kind of focused. But a lot of my mentors uh, started moving toward metabolic approaches to looking at living systems. And fire is an example, like in an animal cell that does respiration and combustion. We breathe out carbon dioxide and water. Right? We are doing the equivalent of fire. Uh, a plant is doing, when they do photosynthesis, is taking water, carbon dioxide, and creating a carbohydrate or sugar and oxygen. Right? A fire is oxygen plus carbohydrate, creating water and uh, carbon dioxide. So, it, and so, so this idea that the fire is just the opposite of photosynthesis, and the tree is either becoming, coming out of the sky, and forming itself or going back into the sky. You know, so, and, and when people see a fire, letting them to start to understand that that, that white smoke is water. You know, if you time lapse it, it, you can think of it as a geyser coming out of the forest, right? And it's not this monster that's this other thing. It's so embedded in the chemistry. And, and when you stomp on it, as Adrian's talking about, you, 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 in, the, in the, the great fires in the early 1900s, when the, before there was really a forest service, um, you know, we kind of thought, just like damming up rivers, right? So let's, let's control this and stop it. Now we talk about climate change as definitely an issue, but it's not as big as the human impact of stopping fire. So, you know, for example, Mexico's in the same climate as, as California but it doesn't have massive fires because they, they're at this natural balance. If you, if you have a dense forest that burns down, the next season, it's not dense enough so that a lightning strike, you know, it grows back. And at that, there's, in, in complexity, we talk about a phase transition. There's a critical point. It's a very narrow regime 
that that nature pushes gets pushed to that's very uh, fractal and has biodiversity and it's very chaotic in that regime and that's where life lives and but we're way outside of that right now in our current fuels as Adrian's kind of talking about it's, it's really dense so you know right now at while we're recording this is probably one of the biggest historic uh, collection of fires in northern California and even in New Mexico we have a nice little small one in a, a media fire uh, going on right now just north of town uh, near the um, uh, uh, near the reservoir um, so I think this perception is very important and 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 the community and fire is moving away from Smokey Bear putting out all fires to Smokey Bear starting to uh, carry a drip torch and prescribe burning and managing the fuels and um, and how do we, uh, if you ever look up fire adapted communities, how do we live with fire? And, and it's sometimes just, you know, the embers, making sure your house can withstand the embers. That's really what burns down. It's not this big, usually wall of flame coming through town. It's these little small starts. And there's many ways of living and architecting a lot more intelligently. You know? And I think one last thing that's nice about fire is it's not yet politicized in our country. And it's what time when a community can come together and address it. You know, COVID has the same kind of dynamics that spreads through a community like wildfire. There's the same kind of phase transitions and things you can do, but it's still a little, it's a little, it got politicized, right? But wildfire is that place that we can have a common, and it's not even an enemy. It even is changing the, the mentality. It's, the fire is not an enemy. It's just something to learn to live with. And, 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 and how do we, as a community, get a little smarter together? How do we have collective intelligence? You know? Yeah, well, and also just to um, appreciate that there are, like, that's a natural part of society um, and nature and the way that we live. Uh, just like COVID is, uh, viruses are, like, natural. They are, um, for every, like, living being, there is a virus that is associated with that biology, right? So. It's not like one is good and one is bad. And um, it's hard to, to cast judgment um, on those things. It's sad when people's lives are affected negatively by these greater forces in nature. But um, we also just have to acknowledge that that is a part of being alive. Just like when you were, that was what I was thinking when you were describing how um, trees burning down in a, in a forest fire are releasing their oxygen and it's all about these gas exchanges and energy exchanges and that's just that is natural and you can't just blanket statement say that's bad let's stop doing that let's make sure we we stop this enemy and it it, it can't be politicized in that way because it's required for life to exist i'll just continue yeah um one other kind of similarity with COVID too is we can't let, we can't wait for the government, like in the campfire, by the time the government, the you know, CAL FIRE and the um, emergency response and the 911, reverse 911, sensing where the fire was and then uh, giving um, the call and notifications was, was too slow, right? It's the people themselves that need to organize that can have the intel, you know, there was 50,000 phones uh, with cameras up on, you know, in paradise. Can we be collectively intelligent and, 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 and know what's going on in our community and inform each other, right? And the same thing with COVID, it's possible to track where COVID is, the infections, if we have location data from the citizens, but not giving that to the government or to Google and Facebook. There's ways to coordinate our own locations and being smarter and, and adaptive. And so I, you know, I liken it when we have the number of COVID cases per day, per county or zip code, that's like hearing, oh, there's as many acres burned today in this county. And that you can't fight a fire with those numbers. You, you know, you do, what do you put water on the whole county? And that's like shutting down the whole economy, right? So we need to know exactly where that contagion is happening, which is, you know, the front of a forest fire is, and that's where you, you need to kind of steer it. And, and, and act, having very dense fuels is like having no immunity and herd immunity is kind of getting down to when you're in that fractal regime and, and kind of managing your, your susceptible populations and you're in uh, recovered is kind of like managing your fuels and your black, you know, the burnt areas. So there's a lot of, I think, you know, wildfire is a nice opportunity to, 
to learn to act collectively and uh, you know apply it to other spaces. Yeah. And just as a, a follow up question, you know, both of your work is really about creating something kind of tactile based on data. And I want to talk about how that creates community interaction, you know, in your specific um, with your sand tables, Stephen, and then also with your interest in phenomenology, um, Adrian. Yeah, on, on my side, when we saw firefighters using sand tables, we initially designed the table to help train firefighters of how to stop a fire when they put down bulldozers or hand crews that are digging with shovels and chainsaws to cut line or where to put helicopters and the retardant from the very large air tankers, the VLATs. Um, but about four years into it, you know, as we saw people, customers ordering more or using it more, we found 10 to 1, they're using it for community outreach and, and, and educating the neighborhoods and getting the communities understanding their neighborhood, their terrain, and, and having a very uh, physical interaction of sculpting their neighborhood. You know, people know their road networks very well, but do they really know their drainages and how the water flows, which you know, fire wants to go uphill and water wants to run downhill, so they're very related. And so letting people tangibly sculpt their neighborhoods to think about where the risk of fire is going to come from, the fire shed, they've, you know, we've adopted that term like a watershed. Watershed is, for my point of land, where does the water come from uphill? And a fire shed would be, you know, uh, where are all the downhill places that I'm at risk at, at, and up, upwind? So it's a wind and terrain driven thing. So it's a very, so giving people that tangible physical ability to, and also to share in a shared way, construct their own neighborhoods together is kind of a, a good icebreaker. And they, they're, they're creating a shared artifact uh, when they might come into a community meeting trying to argue for their one side. I think it's a nice way that they, they realize they're sharing the same space and sharing some people share the same fire shed, just like they may share the same watershed that goes across political boundaries, right? Uh, as small as like a Pueblo in New Mexico with a, a neighboring town or two kids uh, in a school may have sharing a watershed. But even when you look at San Diego and Tijuana, right? There's a massive watershed coming out of Tijuana from Rodriguez Dam. And the fact that we, you know, are just bordering that up when, you know, so it's, it's, it's there's a different ap appreciation when you look at the land and terrain and the water and the fire. You know, I think it's, it goes beyond the political boundaries that we tend to put on top of it in the roads, you know. Yeah, and my, my approach is um, similar, but I, I am quite interested in tapping into ways to communicate that go beyond cognitive abilities. Um, because we are minds, but we're in bodies. And um, by only speaking to the mind, you leave out um, a very uh, fundamental um, embodied cognition that could be a really good way to engage people with ideas. And I, I have a deep interest in science, but I find myself quite frustrated in the way that science is communicated to the public. And, um, I, I appreciate why science, the field of science is set up the way that it does. It's very important to be as objective as possible when studying the world around us to understand it without bias. But I do believe that for the, um, the, to apply the knowledge that we gain from these scientific studies and research, we need to be able to um, communicate that effectively to people. And, my interest in creating a tactile representation of scientific information is to make it accessible to people in a totally different way than a dry scientific report or a table of numbers or even you know a fire progression map because a lot of people aren't going to connect themselves and their lives necessarily to that piece of information, that graphic. Um, I, I think there's a lot to be said for having some kind of emotional engagement with the, the thing you're trying to communicate. And I think that by making a physical experience that people can share or engage with an object that taps into both 
their, um, their body and their mind because of the data behind it, they can start to understand it in a different way that might be more intuitive than, uh, than explaining it didactically or through numerical analysis. A lot of people just don't, um, it's not gonna pull them in and make them excited about an idea. So that's where I think that physical objects are more creative expressions of the ideas that, that science is, is bringing into the world can really get people a lot more excited about things that are actually very, very important but not always so um, intuitive to understand. Yeah, I think that's very important. The communication and, and you know, where art, science, and technology um, you can help with the human computer interaction, right? I think right at that, um, that the, the art of being able to not just present the, the data, but how people interact with it right um and you know if you look at the current show i think is a great example in new mexico of people thinking how do we move outside of the screen right and there's a lot of projected generative art uh, going on uh, so uh, and how do we think of new media and, and the room itself and the outside the rail yard for instance if there is sometimes there's projections there how do we think of moving computing out into the physical world again. This, uh, um, and so I'm really um, I'm encouraged by a lot of the artists and the organizers of Currents on, on wh wh what they are, are bringing together and people kind of pushing that boundary of that science, tech, and art boundary. Um, and you know, ultimately, if we can grow, you know, I think Adrian's very interested. We've talked in the past of not using very um, expensive high-end tools, like what can you capture with your phone when you do photogrammetry uh, so that people, if they wanna make their own physical uh, artifacts. And so can we teach the young, young people how to do modeling, visualization, and physical computing, but using just, you know, really phones and uh, low-end projectors um, is all they need, right? And, and, and getting, and ultimately growing, you know, it's one thing to have a scientist and artist collaborating, uh, or a technician and an artist, but if we can really grow an artist, a scientist, and a technician in one person, I think that's when you really, you really see the, you know, that's exciting to me, and I see that kind of effort happening both up in Oakland and in Santa Fe. So I think those are two special places where you where you see that kind of mixing. And so this is kind of a way of wrapping up this conversation, but. I'm wondering about the kind of end game, if there is one for both of you, you know, um, is it, is your physicalization process really about creating awareness post-mortem after a fire has already happened? Is it about prevention or is it simply about a new relationship that we can have to the natural world potentially? And I think we've, we've answered part of that question, but as a way to wrap it up, you know, how do you see that? that role? Mm, that's, a, that's a great question. I, um, I could speculate on a number of different like results I'd like to see from how people interact with my work, but ultimately I, um, I don't try to prescribe a, a message in the work that I make. I try to present the ideas somewhat objectively in just a, an, a, an evocative kind of engaging form that draws people in um, without necessarily knowing what data is being represented or that data is even being embedded in a form. And um, that way they come to their own conclusions about what they learn by investigating the, the piece, either by reading the title of the artwork and learning what information is behind it or what is being represented. Um, and I, I like that because I see the, the role of an artist and the role of a scientist or a technologist. We all have very different um, goals. And um, I forget the famous quote, but the, the role of the artist is to ask questions, not to answer them. So. I like to leave that up to the viewers um, or the, the people who, who see the work and engage with it. And, um, and I just hope to like 
put ideas out in the world in a way that brings people in and makes them wonder a bit more about some of these dynamic, crazy, amazing, beautiful forces that are happening all around us um, at any given time, because it's, it's exciting to, to learn more about the world and um, helps you kind of figure out where you get meaning and um, what our place is in the universe. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. Um, it reminds me of my mentor, Stu Kaufman, who studies origin of life. And people have insulted him, but I think it's the highest compliment. Um, you know, he, they, they, they say he always asks uh, important questions, but never has the right answers, right? But I think uh, asking the right question is so important in science and, and moving the, the paradigm. And which is also related maybe to Donnell Mellows in the Meadows in the, in the 90s and 80s. You know, it's one thing to optimize systems. She talked about leverage points of how to change a system. And one is, you, you know, near the, near the leverage or the fulcrum is just optimizing the current uh, systems or later looking at feedbacks or self-organizing systems. But as you get further out there where you have the most leverage is changing the paradigm of how we, and our worldviews of how we see ourselves, right? And so I'm not really communicate. I'm not, I don't have an end game of what I'm trying to communicate. I'm, it's more of a personal, I can say where I'm kind of learning, right? And where I'm kind of observing. It is moving away. Uh, another one of my colleagues has a nice quote of, um, life is not something that happens uh, uh, on the earth. It's something that happens to the earth, right? As we start to look at, and even like a fire, if you look at that as one side of the chemical reaction and in photosynthesis, it's going the other way. And so if this is like a mitochondria and a chloroplast in a plant, it's that channel that we're finding is alive. Not a, it's not an individual property, it's an ecological property, right? So just in my own explorations, as I, as I look at these systems and processes, how, how do you look from a more ecological mindset uh, and, and, and how we are much more and more embedded in the system and we're not on top of it, we're not stewards of it, we're not controllers of it, how are we much more embedded? And I think that's the challenge for the next couple decades and and it, and and it also bridges the gap of this artificial debate of science and religion even and Santa Fe is a very spiritual place as well so it's this uh, city of holy faith um, and there's this artificial divide between this mechanistic reductionist scientific Darwin view and a creation personal God view but there, there's a dialogue somewhere in the middle that's um, can be very fruitful uh, as, as you take these more ecological um, perspectives and that it is a much more connected space um, and so I, you know, I look forward for the next couple of decades I think optimistically we're, we're heading in that direction I mean uh, we could go very south but hopefully there's some north that we could be going to as well thank you so much I think that's a really beautiful way to end in terms of how do we think about changing paradigms and I, that's the question that we're all faced with so thank you very much for joining us Great. Thank you. Thanks. Friends Move near to Santa Fe, Adrian. Come to Santa Fe. <laughs> I would love to. Yeah. So the last thing you said reminded me there's a, a similar kind of saying in, in art, more or less, where it's not the objective, like the object itself is not where the, the, the action happens. It's how the object of art, what it does to you inside is what the real art is. And so it, it sort of has this kind of spiritual tone to it as well, but kind of like the object is the vessel by which we have an experience that changes our perceptions as opposed to the uh, art object being this like external the thing, thing that yeah, sits yeah. on a pedestal. You know? Yeah. Great. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thanks, Megan. Yeah. Thanks, Alicia. And Amy for organizing in the background. <laughs> yeah.